Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome you to our Zoom meeting on behalf of Liberal Voice for Women. We're a special interest group of Liberal Democrat members and supporters aiming to promote the interests of women and girls within our party. We're focusing in these meetings upon topics which we feel the Liberal Democrats need to understand and discuss openly. We feel it is clear that some of the party's current policies are not in the interests of girls and women. Tonight's topic was the subject of an intense debate in the House of Lords last year when the Ministerial and Other Maternity Allowances Bill was debated. The bill used gender neutral language in referring to ministers who were pregnant and their lordships insisted on ensuring that the accurate terms women and mothers were used. Lib Dem Baroness Hussein Etcher noticed the confusion in the bill and the need for clarity. Now, those of you who've been here before know this already, but for new participants, please put your questions in the chat as we go along and I'll call on you to ask them at the end. If you don't want to ask your own questions yourself, let me know and I can ask it for you. We're recording this event and it will be put on YouTube as soon as we can get it. All but two of our events have been recorded and are available at the Liberal Voice for Women channel. Subscribe and share them with your friends if you wish. I suggest that you put your Zoom screen on speaker view for the best view of the discussion and mute yourself um, to get ready to hear an eloquent advocate for labouring women. Now, let me introduce you to our guest. Millie Hill trained as a psychotherapist, became a journalist, a writer and campaigner, whose website is www.millihill.co.uk. You can follow her on Twitter at Millie Hill. Millie was part of the Sheila Kitzinger Symposium at Green Templeton College, Oxford, and is one of the advisory group for sex matters. She's written for The Telegraph, The Guardian, The Eye Paper, Good to Know, Male Plus, and Mother and Baby. She's written three books, The Positive Birth Book, Give Birth Like a Feminist, and the one I've just read, My Period, Aimed at Preteens. She'll be talking about uniquely female experiences. So, handing over to you now, Millie, I'm going to put my screen on speaker view and turn my picture off. So, okay. hopefully, I haven't on my screen now. There's a little, <coughs> a little bit of a problem. Okay. Far okay? away. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Good to go. Okay. Well, thanks very much for that lovely warm welcome. And thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you tonight. Um, there are three children in the house, so interruptions or fits of screaming in the background are a distinct possibility and apologies in advance if that happens. <laughs> Don't be alarmed. Um, so I thought I'd start by talking about Adam Kay, um, who's been in the news and been talked about quite a lot in the last few days. Um, the new BBC adaptation of his best-selling book, This Is Going To Hurt, has got everyone talking. And as much as I hate the book and the series, it's good to see a spotlight being shone on misogyny in the birth room. Because I wrote a book about this. Birth as a feminist issue was really what drew me into the topic of birth in the first place. When I had my first child in 2008 and started to mingle with mothers at baby groups, etc., I was shocked by the numbers of women who were traumatized by their birth experiences and the still more numbers who were not so much traumatized as let down, disappointed, shocked, or just plain sad about what happened to them when they had their babies. Did it have to be this way? This question preoccupied me and I had to have another baby myself, very differently to my first birth experience in order to get closer to the answer. When what we see now with the BBC adaptation of This Is Going To Hurt and with the huge response to it from traumatized women is that most people do actually think it does have to be this way. There are some horrible moments in the book version of This Is Going To Hurt. When the book first came out, women used to screenshot them and send them to me. For example, and this one is in my book, Give Birth Like a Feminist, his story of the woman with the nine page laminated full color birth plan, who in spite of her plans for a natural birth needed a cesarean. As far as I know, 
In reality, women don't have nine page laminated birth plans. But in this story, the birth plan stands for something. It stands for a woman who stupidly thought she could have a say. The idea of her doing it in color further infantilizes her, giving the reader the impression of her at her kitchen table with the felt tips out like a child doing her homework. Then she laminates it to show what a controlling little diva she is. But of course, unlike her, Adam knows exactly what will happen next. This is what he says. He says, two centuries of obstetricians have found no way of predicting the course of a labor, but a certain denomination of floaty dressed mother seems to think she can manage it easily. The misogyny here lies in the idea that Kay holds the wisdom and the power from the start and that the run up to his life-saving interventions is just a little game of let's pretend that everyone has to play to humor the woman into thinking how ridiculous hypnobirthing classes were worth it. It's as if every woman he wheels off to theater is just another tick in the box, confirming him to be utterly right that women really are as stupid as they are defective. However, it's important at this point to say we cannot see Adam as an outlier. There's no point canceling Adam, that won't help. <clears throat> We have to remember that this book was a multi-million copy bestseller. It spent eight months at the top of the Sunday Times bestseller list, was translated into 37 languages and has a long line of celebrity endorsements and major book awards. And of course, it's now been made into a major TV series with the multi-award winning Ben Whishaw in the leading role. Clearly an awful lot of people took no issue with it and found it hilariously funny. And this is what we need to shine a spotlight on. This is how it connects to the work I've been trying to do. It's not helpful to make it all about Adam or to blame the overstretched NHS. Doing this ignores that until a now growing group of women said, I don't find this funny, the majority of people were laughing their heads off about it. It's amazing when you think about it that nobody involved in the TV adaptation paused even for a moment to say, hang on, what about the women in this story? How are we portraying them? How is this going to land with those who have experienced birth trauma? Unfortunately, the reason they didn't is because so many people simply believe this is how birth has to be. They actually think like Adam. They think birth is inherently traumatic. Women's bodies are faulty. Doctors are gods who know best. Birth plans are pointless. Only a mad person would give birth at home. You have to leave your dignity at the door and a healthy baby is all that matters. None of these things are true, but they are woven so deeply through our culture that a book like This Is Going To Hurt can sell millions and get adapted for the BBC. Fish can't see the water they swim in. It's this that we need to challenge, this collective shrug at birth trauma and acceptance that it's just another crap thing about being a woman, something we have to unquestioningly accept or even find funny. Because birth does not have to be traumatic. If your birth was, you were almost certainly failed, let down by a self-righteous system that, like Adam, is so busy mocking and blaming women that it fails to look in the mirror. Women who have failed and let down by the system most often blame themselves. The narrative that we see in This Is Going To Hurt becomes part of their version of events too. They will often think that the reason they felt so awful postnatally is their own fault. They should not have got their hopes up, made a birth plan, done yoga or hypnobirthing, thought about birth as a positive or empowering experience. If they had just accepted their own powerlessness, they would not be so traumatized. But of course that's victim blaming. The woman is left with all the awful feelings and the system never considers the role it's playing in birth trauma, postnatal depression, etc. Anyway, <clears throat> it's good that everyone is talking about this. And I suppose in a weird way, we have Adam to thank for that. My passion, as some of you know, is to challenge the negative narrative around women's bodies and encourage the idea that the female body is something that works, something to be proud of. Never that women's horizons should be limited by their biology, but simply that when or if they come to birth, they should not only have first class respectful care, but also have an inbuilt confidence in their bodies and their ability to access their own life-giving power. They should come to the other side of birth empowered rather than traumatized. 
In more recent times, I've also written about menstruation for preteen girls with the same message. Your female body is interesting, it's something powerful and clever, and it's something to understand, appreciate and love. And as some of you also know, I've come under fire for wishing to stick to sex-based language. Initially, this baffled me. Why me? At first, it felt like writing about stuff like birth, breastfeeding, motherhood and periods was a million miles away from issues around gender and being trans. It took me a long time to see that the aim is actually to uncouple the concept of woman from biology. Until you do this, you cannot make woman an open category. Woman remains annoyingly tethered to biological reality. And if that's the case, men can't be women. When you think about it like this, you can see precisely why I ended up in the firing line. During 2020, my project became reading everything I could find about gender. In the birth world, I had noticed more and more people using terms like birthing people and assigned female at birth, etc., quite suddenly, almost overnight. I didn't have any massive objection to these changes, but I wanted to know why I was supposed to say them, where had they come from, who had chosen them and why, etc. I asked these questions in birth and midwifery groups, and every time I did, the reaction was off the scale. Dialogue was immediately shut down. I was asked not to post, and in one group, I was asked to leave. It was clear these questions were not acceptable. This made me ever more curious. So I did a lot of more of my own reading and began to understand that this wasn't as simple as just societal progress towards inclusivity. I began to understand that these changes were ideological and were to do with replacing the material reality of sex with a somewhat nebulous concept of gender. So the very innocent seeming and inverted commas inclusive phrase, women and birthing people, was actually quite a clever way of changing the definition of the word woman from a female person to an identity. Because when you say women and birthing people, you are agreeing that not everyone who gives birth is a woman. You are saying there are two types of human who give birth, women and birthing people. So you've changed woman from a description of sex to an identity, just like that, and probably without realizing it or without thinking, of what the implications of this change might be. So I was thinking about all this and then what happened next, some of you may have read about. To cut a long story short, in November, 2020, I commented on an Instagram post which said, obstetric violence is about power and patriarchy. Birthing people are seen as the fragile sex who need to be kept under patriarchal authority by doctors. This jarred, so I challenged it. I said, it is women who are seen as the fragile sex, etc., and obstetric violence is violence against women. Let's not forget who the oppressed are here and why. And as some of you may know, all hell broke loose. In what can only be described as a social media bin fire, I was called violent, a piece of shit, turf, toxic, dangerous, a vile creature, willfully harmful, and more and more and more. As the bin fire blazed, the charity Birthrights, with whom I had worked closely and supported for nearly 10 years, made a social media post about inclusivity, which everyone in the world of maternity could immediately identify as being pointed at me. Later that night, as I sat on my sofa in utter shock at what was happening, I received an email from the CEO of Birthrights, effectively saying that they would no longer associate with me. Birthrights and others who are similarly ideologically captured may have uncoupled the word woman from material reality, but I have not. It is not birthing people who are seen as the fragile sex or as vessels, disposable containers for the next generation whose feelings and experiences are secondary. It is women. And I am using the word woman in its sexed sense, female people. The oppression of women in childbirth, and in particular obstetric violence, is sex-based. It happens to women not because of their gender identity, but because of their sex. As in so many other situations, denying this biological reality and taking away the words to describe it will only enable it to go unchallenged. 
This has been explored recently by a group of academics in a new paper entitled Effective Communication About Pregnancy, Birth, Lactation, Breastfeeding and Newborn Care, The Importance of Sexed Language. The authors, a global team of women's health experts, warn that while de-sexing the language of female reproduction is done with the intent of being kind, and this is a quote, they say, this kindness has delivered unintended consequences that have serious implications for women and children. They cited that, December, that September 2021 front cover of the world-renowned Lancet Journal, remember that? Referring to women as bodies with vaginas as a prime example of the trends to remove sex terms such as women and mothers from discussions around female reproduction, a trend that may be born of good intentions, but without consideration of the possible consequences. <clears throat> when women hear inclusive terminology, they very often find it immediately dehumanizing. We instinctively don't want to be called birthing bodies or cervix havers or non-men. The paper authors agree and mention the long history of the medical profession sidelining and dismissing women's bodies as faulty and treating the male body as standard. This language, they say, threatens to unravel decades of work in improving the visibility of women in medicine. Added to this, they argue, instead of being inclusive, the new terminology risks excluding some women, in particular those who are young or who have low literacy or education or those who are not reading information in their first language. In a world in which even educated women may not know the location of their cervix, or even if they have one, being referred to as a cervix haver may actually put them at risk of missing vital health information. Sex-based language matters when it comes to informing women of their rights too. It's not the same to talk about pregnant families giving informed consent in labor. This implies that people other than the woman are entitled to make choices about what happens to her body when people like me have been striving for the opposite, clear autonomy for the woman in labor. And say the researchers, inclusive language can risk obscuring data. If we state that one in 20 people are susceptible to a particular medical condition, this is a different statistic to suggesting one in 20 women are susceptible. Which is it? And why would we think that leaving out the word woman is important enough to risk obscuring important health messages? In December 2021, I called out the RCM, the Royal College of Midwives, on social media for failing to mention women or mothers in their safe sleeping guidelines, but instead referring to postnatal people. The RCM apologised and withdrew the guidance for review, but this is unusual. Most organisations seem completely determined that these changes will have no negative impact whatsoever. This has been the prevailing narrative that there is absolutely nothing to lose and everything to gain from so-called additive language. But the authors of the new paper not only beg to differ, they have clearly set out the precise ways in which these changes can be detrimental, as well as being dehumanizing and obscuring health messages, de-sexed language could also undermine breastfeeding, they say, for example, by disembodying it and making this human milk sound like something separate to the mother. And if we lose the word mother, we lose something bigger than the word, they argue. It's a word that holds meaning beyond parent. It is the first word that most infants will say and perhaps the oldest word ever spoken. Do we really want to replace it and potentially risk losing all of the nurture and connection that is associated with it too? And I regret to inform you that female is also under siege. <laughs> Recently, I noticed Eddie Izzard is to be cast in a female reimagining of Jekyll and Hyde. And as I said earlier, when talking about Adam Kay, there's often a setup that occurs that leads women to blame themselves for their inability to have a straightforward birth. Women are placed into environments that are built without their physiology in mind. In fact, most modern birth rooms are built with the needs of midwives and doctors uppermost, bright lights so they can see, beds so they can easily reach. Sterile environments, interruptions, strangers, not what women who are mammals need to produce the hormones of birth. But when placed in this environment, their bodies then don't labor in a straightforward way. Women most often blame themselves and their faulty female physiology. Sometimes birth units are built differently with birth pools or double beds, pretty lighting, art on the walls, etc. 
when I recently praised one such room on social media for being built with female physiology in mind, someone corrected me and told me I should say, birth rooms built with birthing people's physiology in mind. But again, this erasure of women from the language, in fact, this time it's the word female, not women they're objecting to, obscures biological reality and removes the words we need to highlight specific female needs. And it, set back, it sets back the progress of all the women, including Sheila Kitzinger, who we've mentioned, who've been trying for decades to highlight that female physiology is being overlooked and who have repeatedly been pointing out that paying more attention to female physiology would almost certainly dramatically reduce the huge numbers of difficult and traumatic births. The female body is a mystery, even to many of us who inhabit one. In a recent survey, only 9% of Britons could label all parts of the vulva, 37% mislabeled the clitoris, and less than half, 46%, knew that women have three holes. In another recent survey, survey, almost half of women didn't know where their cervix was. There are so many gaps in our knowledge about female biology and negativity loves these vacuums. This is why so many people watch This Is Going To Hurt and just accept, oh, that's what birth is like because there is intergenerational trauma now. Our mothers and grandmothers experienced obstetric violence and disrespectful care. My inspiration for writing a period book for preteen girls came from a workshop I attended with Australian Jane Hardwick Collings, who runs the School of Shamanic Womancraft out there. She made me realize the connection between the cultural narratives around menstruation and those around birth. Periods and childbirth are connected. Why had I never thought of that? On a workshop with her, she asked me to consider questions such as, how were you born? How was your mother born? What were your mother's experiences of pregnancy and birth? How was she told about menstruation or birth by her mother? How were you told about periods? How was your first period? What happened? How did you feel when you were first pregnant, etc.? I highly recommend spending some time thinking about these questions about the stories you and your mother and her mother were told about their bodies and notice any threads of interconnectedness. Some people call the maternal line in a family, the red thread. Many of today's women don't have any positive narratives about periods, birth or breastfeeding. And many women struggle with some or all of these aspects of being female. And yet at a time when women passing on wisdom to women is so needed, Suddenly, there is a taboo around all of this language. In the past 10 to 15 years, social media, for all its ills, has offered an opportunity for women to learn more about their bodies and to share and explore the biological experience of being female. I've been proud to be a part of that. Running the positive birth movement, some of my activism was centered around sharing images of labor and birth that challenged the dominant narrative that women in labor were weak, helpless, and in need of rescue. And it used to get me banned from social media. There were a couple of high profile occasions when I was kicked off Facebook for it, most memorably on the day in November 2014, when Kim Kardashian's bottom was supposed to be breaking the internet. I don't know if anyone remembers that. <laughs> By coincidence, I had shared a picture of a birthing bottom that day and got banned for it. It was too tempting to tweet the two bums side by side and ask why are some bottoms acceptable but others not so much. It was funny, but it also resulted in a conversation happening around the world about the power of birth and why we might want to censor such images. Writing at the time, I pointed out that women needed to see such images precisely because they challenged the standard, sterile, controlled, managed images of births, and that at the same time, the way the images challenged this status quo was precisely why they were censored. And as well as birth images, women have used social media to share lactation, breastfeeding, pubic hair, period blood, fat, cellulite, miscarriage and baby loss and more. All these uniquely female experiences have for so long been completely unspoken and taboo. And so many of the images of them on social media were taken down and censored and women fought battles for them to be restored and allowed. And yet now, just as that seems to be somewhat resolved, we have a new censorship. 
Even the phrase uniquely female experiences itself will be problematic to some. We have to watch our words around these topics of women's bodies again. Is this a coincidence? The misogyny we see beamed into our living rooms via this is going to hurt is a part of obstetric violence. It's part of a culture that normalizes obstetric violence. Just as sexist jokes normalize misogyny and by extension violence against women, the mocking of laboring women helps to prop up a system in which disrespect and abuse take place. Venezuela was the first country to formally define obstetric violence making it one of 19 kinds of punishable violence against women. They define it in this way. The appropriation of a woman's body and reproductive processes by health personnel in the form of dehumanizing treatment, abusive medicalization and pathologization of natural processes involving a woman's loss of autonomy and of the capacity to freely make her own decisions about her body and sexuality, which has negative consequences for a woman's quality of life. Like all violence against women, obstetric violence happens to women, not because of their identity, but because of their sex. And nowhere is a woman's sex more obvious than in labor and birth. Women like me were trying to use our platform to challenge this situation, but now we are being deplatformed and discredited and quite frankly, distracted from our work. If we will not agree that womanhood has no basis in biology. For this reason, I'm extremely grateful to be given a platform here by you today. Last year, I was successfully deplatformed from a midwifery conference in New Zealand. In spite of the board initially saying they would stand firm, they quickly backpedaled and gave in to the campaigners against me because, as I understand it, they felt their jobs were at stake over this issue. I'm very aware that I am not silenced. I am still writing and speaking, etc. But some of the things that have happened to me over the past year or two have shown me that women can be punished, their platforms can be removed, they can feel forced to comply or risk their career or livelihood, and it's actually quite scary. But in spite of this, I won't deny biological reality, and I won't be stripped of the words I need to describe it, nor will I be dehumanized by terms such as cervix haver, vagina owner, body with a vagina or non-man. Women need words to, to challenge and change core and disrespectful care. And we need words to describe our unique female experiences without hesitation or censorship and to bloody well celebrate them. Thank you. Thank you for that talk. That's really interesting. And I think we've got the, an overview of the sorts of things that you're, you've been saying. Um, uh, we've got to a number of points that we've been putting up, posting in the, uh, in the chat. And we've got a question here. Um, I'm not sure whether Jenny wants to uh, ask it yourself, um, but uh, I'm not sure whether Jenny wants to ask Jenny, over to um, I just wanted, uh, if you feel this is on topic, off topic completely, just shut me down, but it, it does seem to me to be related, um, which is the great rise in the other big thing that removes women from the narrative of birth for me is commercial surrogacy. And um, I kind of see these things as related and I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that too. Well, I'll be really honest with you. Um, it's not an area that I have ventured into yet. Um, I have, um, it has obviously, for obvious reasons, come up on my radar, in particular um, in the last year or so since I've sort of become more involved in conversation with radical feminists. But I wouldn't really feel confident to speak on it at this point, to be, to, if that's okay. Um, because I think it's it's another it's another complicated area that I would rather delve into deeply and research before I felt confident to talk on it. Is that okay? Yeah. It seems to me that the relationship is the removal of actual women from from the process. So I look forward to you getting yeah. <laughs> involved in it. But I'll leave it for now. 
I think you're right. And I, you know, I think there's a lot, there's a lot going on there, isn't there? And it's definitely, um, yeah, there's definitely, I think it's also, um, it's, it's, it's kind of like some, some of it that I'm already thinking about is it's to, is it to do with this sort of move away from nature, if that makes sense, but, um, you know, sort of separating us out into parts rather than holistic, you know, looking at us as humans, which definitely does, in, has been part of what I've already written about in terms of birth, you know, but the, the medicalization and the kind of, um, you know, the, the dehumanization of care, where, you know, like, for example, one of the things I was writing about the other day is how in the pandemic, um, women have been told um, everything's, because of the pandemic, we're stripping everything down to, to the most essential parts. And that's been so revealing because the most essential parts, as it turns out, of maternity care have been the beeping machines and the, you know, the monitors and the measuring, but not human con connection, having your partner with you, maybe having a doula, maybe having a birth center birth or a home birth. All of those things have been considered non-essential. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's quite revealing in terms of how we see birth, you know, just, I, I don't know if that's, makes sense Jenny with in the context yes, as a mechanical question. process without the involvement but yeah no thank you yeah. yeah the dehumanization and the lack of human connection and the sort of the the product the sort of um looking for the to get the product rather than the means that, to the end if that makes sense yes yeah Thanks, but I'll, I think, I'll think about it some more <laughs> I think, I think, I think <laughs> Who want to buy your book about it when you do come round to talk about it? The commodification of birth um, yeah. is a pregnancy and birth is a real problem, I think, for, for feminists. Mm. Yeah. Um, Zoe I think, has got a question. Zoe Hollywood, who is our chair oh, I do. of Liberal Voice Women. Hi, you... Millie. Um, by the way. So I was just wondering, is there a postcode lottery when it, do you, do you see a postcode lottery when it comes to birth care? Because I've given birth four times now and, you know, they weren't perfect, but actually I have pretty good experiences. Um, and sometimes I read these stories and I'm, I'm really horrified and I can't imagine any of the midwives who I've been in contact with being like that. And, and, and pick, perhaps it's not necessarily the midwives, but, um, but yeah, just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Yeah. I think there is a postcode lottery, definitely. Um, and I think cultures develop within particular units or, you know, hospitals. You know, we can see that from how, you know, the, the, the figure, the, the stats for different units and hospitals are different. And unfortunately, sometimes, you know, a scandal will happen where, you know, they'll realise there's been too many women dying in a particular hospital or too many babies dying. That's the extreme end of it, I suppose. Um, so yeah, I think it just, it does, it does, it's quite difficult, um, you know, because you, you, obviously if you're going to have, unless you have, it, sometimes people who have an elective caesarean will go to, will drive for it to get to a different place, to have a different doctor wow. who will perhaps give them a woman-centered caesarean, whereas where they live, that's not on offer. Um, but if, if obviously you're having a vaginal birth or hoping to, then you can't really do that. <laughs> yeah, no, fair point. No, I think that's really interesting. And I was just reading the um, spooky story today about the, uh, is spooky the right word, sort of gut churning story about the Obs and Gynae. Um, I think they were a, a, a doctor who sexually assaulted um, some children. I think it was in the Times. Um, and apparently he basically took pictures of women during cesarean sections and things like this without their permission. And um, and a lot of the story was about exactly that, that although complaints had been made, he basically bullied people. So I guess there can be bad eggs. It's not even necessarily a culture of that particular region, is it? There can be bad eggs at the hospital and they create this culture then that you know feeds down. Sure, and likewise, there can be really good influences that, that yeah. come in. And I think some of that, either way, I mean, obviously that's what you're talking about is a very extreme example. Yeah. But more, yeah. Speaking more generally, I think that, you know, some of those questions that I talked about um, in my talk about, you know, like, what are we bringing? Um, you know, sort of analyzing yourself a little bit in terms of like what your personal experience has been, 
um, you know, how you feel about birth, whether, you know, how you were born. I think all of, you know, people who are working in birth could really perhaps do with asking those questions of themselves, because I think sometimes, you know, because this is what I'm saying about intergenerational trauma, because so many uh, women have had negative experiences themselves and have been told it had to be that way. We yeah. had to treat you that way in order for your baby to be born healthily. You know, then they're take if they are going on to be midwives, they're going on to be obstetricians. Yeah. You know, yeah. so they're taking that baggage with them into their work, and that's how this this culture just keeps perpetuating. And that's how we end up with a program on mainstream television. You know, like this is going to hurt, which which a lot of women are finding absolutely appalling to watch because they just can't. You know, it's because it's re-traumatizing them. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Are we lost? Are we Hi, Millie. Yes. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned something about um uh, a woman-centered cesarean how does that actually work okay so basically the idea of a woman-centered cesarean although some people don't call it that anymore for obvious reasons <laughs> is um that you know a lot of people think oh cesarean you know that's that's just a very medical procedure um and the movement in in woman-centered cesarean has been to say no hang on a minute here you know just because the baby isn't being born, born vaginally doesn't mean that for this woman, it isn't an important day and you know, moment in her life that she's never going to forget, and for her partner as well, obviously. Um, so in women centered cesarean, they do simple things like they cut the chit chat. They don't have the radio on. They might play music of the woman's choice. Um, they create a kind of more respectful, reverent environment in the birth room. Sometimes they have dim lighting. And I know there are, are clinicians who have sort of worked to find ways that they can practice safely, but also have the lightings a bit dimmer because um, dimmer lighting helps with the production of oxytocin, which um, helps with bonding and breastfeeding. Um, in a woman's centered cesarean, they will usually go for immediate skin to skin. Um, so the ECG dots will be placed on the back so that the baby can come onto the, you know, the chest is clear for the baby to be placed on the chest. Um, touches like that. And there's even one guy who I wrote about in my book who gets all, um, everyone in the room, there's quite a lot of people in the room for a cesarean and the woman is catheterized. But when she's being catheterized, everybody apart from the person who's doing the catheterizing um, goes and stands by the woman's head. Um, and that's really unusual, but it's like saying all of the gest, it's lots of gestures, which are all um, saying this, we see that this is an important moment for you. This is not an operation. This is a birth. So that's what, that's what woman centered cesarean is. That makes so much sense. Um, I've got a very close relative who's probably going to end up having a cesarean in a few weeks at one of the London hospitals and it is really the whole thing's really quite stressful at the moment <laughs> yeah and I think it's really it's really lovely to know about things like that isn't it because it can then feel a little bit like you're getting a bit of the power back you're not just a passive object in the experience you know you're actually uh, you know an active participant so. yeah I um, might dm I might dm you after this or, not, or tomorrow or something yeah just that's gotta... fine thank you <laughs> Toby's got a question, um, which you put in the chat earlier, Toby. Fire away. Um, thank you, Alison. Uh, Millie, do you have a feel for the degree to which women who are in these birthing situations are unhappy about the dehumanising and desexing language that's being used towards them and are expressing it at the time and what kind of responses they're getting from the medical professionals? Do you mean, um, you know, birthing people, that type of language? Um, all of the desexing language, but birthing people is the most obviously relevant, yes, but there must be plenty more. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's actually being being used one-to-one, um, -one, face to face, as much as it's being used on things like social media posts, policy documents, um, you know, that kind of stuff. So I don't I don't I don't I don't know to be honest. I haven't heard 
firsthand stories of women saying, oh, I went, you know, when I was at my midwife appointment, you know, I was referred to as a birthing person and it really upset me. I haven't heard anyone say that yet. I think it's more, um, you know, it, on websites, books, policy documents, that kind of thing. And, I, and, and women are obviously objecting to that very much. Thank you. Um, I think Maria's got a question. Uh, Maria, you put a question in the uh, in the chat earlier on. Maria, off-topic question. Maybe you're not able to uh, to do this. Are you? Uh... Says her audio is broken. <laughs> okay. Well, look. Um, it says a slightly off-topic question. We know from the stats that the fertility rate has massively dropped in recent years. Many women who want to have children for various reasons are not having them. But I often worry about discussing that as a problem, as obviously it should be a choice. Do you have any thoughts? Should the government do more to support mums? Could that be playing into the low fertility rate? Is it a problem per se, or is all the talk of it a bit sexist? Do you want to have a go at that? <laughs> Wow. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, it's really, it's a, it's a difficult one to wade in on, isn't it? I know that when, um, you know, people talk about declining fertility, or I think there was somebody fairly recently who was, you know, talking about whether we should um, educate women about declining fertility, um, you know, because obviously some women get a little bit older and then they don't, you know, they're saying, oh, I didn't realize that this was going to affect my fertility. So should we be talking to women about that in advance? Or is that, you know, it's the it's it's part of the minefield that I guess I've been in myself for quite a long time. Because if you're talking about positive births, you know, people are like, well, you know, are you just some kind of like real ultra conservative person who thinks everybody should be, you know, chained to the sink with six children around their ankles? <laughs> because you know, any any conversation about women's fertility or biology, you know, does tend to raise that. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I think. It's very. I think all information is is helpful. Um, this, you know, why shouldn't why shouldn't we have these conversations? It doesn't mean that everybody um, has to have babies. You know, just talking about positive birth doesn't mean that you know that means I think you know motherhood is the only route to happiness. Um, so I and nor nor is a conversation about fertility, but it is important that we we're open about it why is you know what was the what was the rest of the question was it that why is it declining or is it declining yeah I think so. the rest of it was uh, should the government do more to support mums could that be playing into the low fertility rate well i mean it's hard to i don't i don't really know i mean i wonder at the moment with whether the state of the world at the moment would be affecting the fertility rate i mean certainly that, you know the last couple of years it wouldn't it must have been a very difficult decision for women to think do I want to get pregnant at the moment um you know in the midst of a global pandemic which none of us can necessarily see an end to and then I think people are concerned about the environment but I think also you know women are realizing now that they have got more choice it's not so stigmatized anymore to, to say I really don't want to be a parent I don't want to have kids and I and I think that's a positive thing because you know it's definitely I've got three children and I know it definitely has a massive impact on your life choices you know your personal freedom um and you know so I, I totally respect someone's decision to say no I, I want to do foreign travel and career and all of those things instead um so maybe that's impacting on it you know the more freedom women have the more able they are to, to turn that option down completely and the more education women get the the lower fertility rate they have the, the fewer yeah. projects zoe's got a comment that she wants to make on male infertility over to you zoe yeah sorry um this is just something i work on i work for a medical charity and we're trying to get a male infertility program off the ground um and millie i mean i don't know if you can possibly comment on this or if you've even thought about it but um Everyone assumes when you're talking about infertility that you're somehow talking about female infertility. And I think through the ages, females have often been spoken about as being barren, etc. And actually, when you look at the stats, in about 30% of cases, it's purely down to male infertility is the reason a couple are infertile. And in about half and half, about 50%, it's part 
partly that the, the women may have some issues and partly that the man may have some mm. issues. So it's just a complete sort of fallacy that women get blamed in a way for infertility when, you know, there's a huge amount of male infertility that really doesn't get treated. And the sort of second point to that is the way that male infertility is currently treated is via the woman going through a really specialised form of IVF called ICSI, where they inject the sperm into the egg and then implant it. And obviously it's highly, highly invasive for the woman. Um, and a lot of infertile men have actually said, look, I'd like to, you know, you know, it's not the men who are necessarily saying this. They're like, we would like to, to have other treatment options. We would like to be able to take a pill, you know, and improve our own infertility and I just wondered if you'd ever thought of fertility from that angle before yeah I mean it's, it's fascinating to hear what you say and um I think I fell into trap myself actually with answering the previous question of, of sort of focusing oh, no. on women's choice <laughs> to not have have children um but I guess that I do I do tend to think about women more um most in, in most of the work that I do but yeah you're absolutely right um I think there's a lot of um I mean contraception as well as another um you know good example of that isn't it that women are taking a pill um you know 28 days a month sort of thing that is when they're actually only fertile for about three or four days a month um mm -hmm. whereas men are constantly fertile <laughs> <laughs> and they're not taking a pill so we you know there's lots of other conversations around that that you know there's there's lots of sort of uh systemic uh you know sexism kind of baked in to so many of these systems yeah yeah really good point yeah, yeah. okay um kate kate had a comment you want to make kate cod Hi, yes, thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me so my camera's not working. Really, really great talk, Millie, thank you. Um, I was just wondering your thoughts on if, you know, a lot of this, you know, should be, um, these conversations should be stimulated in school. I know from my own experience with my children um, that there is there is a gentle move in PHSE classes um, to discuss uh, sort of more gender neutral terms, inclusivity, which is, you know, fantastic. But I think the issue that I find is, is there's a loss in the distinction of understanding between biological sex and gender. Um, and I, I just wonder whether you think there needs to be sort of more more discussion at schools between between understanding the, the difference essentially yeah I mean I think uh, again a lot of adults are a bit lost and confused about the difference between sex and gender and they're the ones who are doing the teaching so that's probably not going to be helping is it um but you know I I'm I'm still trying to find out what what is actually going on in in primary schools in particular is in regards to you know in, in this country because you do hear a lot of sort of horror stories from America for example about you know what's being spoken about in education but I don't know what's I'm, I'm still trying to learn what's what's actually being talk, taught to children at that level and it seems to me like a lot of it is in a way it's almost too far the other way it's too it's quite regressive really it's very you know stereotypical kind of um stuff about birth and sex and periods and stuff there's you know it seems to be quite dry and quite biological but do you have personal experience of that and you know with your children or with, what's your personal experience of it yeah I mean I find sort of um talking to friends as well it, it seems to be very different and it can be very dependent upon the actual teacher yeah um you know so that very basic understanding but yeah I completely agree it's it's very much this it's very medicalized still with um the, the, the diag the diagrams and things and the, the way that they talk about the process and you know and I have to have sort of additional conversation basic conversation you know about sort of period cycles and things because those sort of things are lost as well you know we, we I just feel that we're still not quite we're not getting it right in that early education that builds those foundations yeah there's you a know, real and I, yeah there's a real resistance to talking about cycles I think with children yeah especially girl, you know because that then then that knocks you into the area of fertility and you know um there's always been this kind of traditional idea i think whether it's spoken or unspoken that talking to girls about their fertility is potentially dangerous because the, the secret that they don't tell 
school children is, you know, what we just said about how you're only fertile for, you know, a few days a month because they, they just don't want girls to, to know that in case they, you know, accidentally, you know, get on, get pregnant basically. So it's, I think yeah. some of it is kind of like they, you know, and as soon as you start to talk about cycles, you have to learn about ovulation and then you, and then you start to unravel the secrets of the female body <laughs> in a way yeah. that has been thought to be potentially damaging. I think there's a real fear around it. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Thank you. But I mean, there's the, you know, we were talking before we started, Alison and I was saying about how there's a, you know, there's a diagram in my period book that has the clitoris on it and it actually has the internal map of the clitoris as well. And, and I think that's the first in a book for children of that age. Um, I don't think that many diagrams uh, that, that, that kids that age get shown actually show the clitoris, which is really interesting, isn't it? Knowledge is power, I think. <laughs> Yeah, um, um, you know, when I was writing the period book, there was we had a conversation with the, the editors and stuff about, um, you know, because I wanted to put in about how your temperature changes to do with when you're ovulating. And there was a bit of resistance to that. They were like, oh, well, you know, they're only little, they, they don't really, you know, they don't want to start taking their temperature every day. You know, that's kind of, that's kind of what you do if you're trying to conceive, basically. And I was like, well, actually, you know, I just think it's interesting. Why shouldn't, why shouldn't you know this about yourself? That's just a really cool thing that your body does. You know, it doesn't mean you have to sort of start charting your temperature, but you know, some 11 year olds might think that was a fun thing to do anyway. It's science, isn't it? So. Um, Deirdre's got a question uh, she wants me to ask. Um, is it the, the fact that so many younger women in their late teens and early 20s seem to be on board with this dehumanizing of women and are accepting the notion of birthing people and that sort of thing? Um, do you think this is dangerous? Um, yeah, I think there has there is a bit of a divide, isn't there, between, uh, you know, younger people and, you know, people over sort of 35 or 40 plus. Um, but I think there are also quite a lot of younger women um, feminists who are getting, who are involved in this conversation. So I don't think it's like completely black and white. Yeah, I mean, I think some of it, it's, I think some of it, certainly in, in the birth world, I think some women sort of my age or older are, are very aware of what happens with gay rights and, quite rightly don't want to be on the wrong side of history in the way that some people probably were you know 30 years ago in terms of gay rights and I think they, they it's framed in the same way quite often um, so I think people I think that's what people are doing I think they're seeing it like that and they're thinking you know it's inclusive and that, but they're not thinking through um, the implications for the language changes and for, you know for changing the meanings of words I've forgotten the question now <laughs> remind me what what it was the question was was it Deirdre's question about young people being on board with the change yeah. of language yeah yeah I mean I think just you know I just don't know I don't know it's it's the whole thing is such a amazing phenomena isn't it that I think it's got it's got you know many angles to it um but I think part of it with younger people perhaps as well as that they don't realize, they don't know the history of how some of the rights that women have at the moment were fought for and won. And therefore they can't see, you know, they can't see what they're potentially losing their grip on. Um, Georgia, Reed Cutting has got a question. Georgia, are you ready to ask? Uh, yes, please. Can you hear me all right? Yep. yep. Hello, um, Millie, thank you very much. You're a bit of a hero of mine. I've been watching you on social media where I look and um, thank you for all you do. Um, my, my question is this, I work, I'm work. i a paediatric dentist who's kind of branched out in other areas and I do a lot of um, Duke of Edinburgh with young people. And through that, I came to realize that girls know absolutely nothing about cystitis and thrush. And then I've got three adult children and through them, I seem to spend an awful lot of time talking about cystitis and thrush, which absolutely blights the life of young women completely unnecessarily because they don't understand simple things like, you know, drink water and pee straight after sex and things like that. Um, and and th what's really horrified me is they get thrush, they get treated for the thrush. 
then they they get antibiotics far too many antibiotics six months worth in some cases then they get cystitis and they go on this sort of hidden cycle of unnecessary medication um, it seems like a trivial and small issue I'm bringing up but young girls aren't taught about this anywhere neither are boys um, it, it's just not raised in schools er, er, you know wherever I come across it and it's it's such a small thing and it would make people so much happier and I'm all about making life happier for people and not having that hideous business to go through so I just wondered can you think of any effective mechanism for getting that out and forgive me I don't know if you if you if you tackle those topics in your books um I don't think I um I don't think I directly talked about cystitis named cystitis and thrush I did talk a little bit about different types of discharge um and you know when when to worry and when not to worry um, and also another point that I make in the book, um, and remember this book is for eight, nine, and 10 year olds. Um, I do talk about um, not needing to use these crazy soaps because I think that's another mm -hmm. really big problem. I'm sure you got them on your radar, you know, yeah. which, which is all to do with this idea that the vagina and the vulva are kind of smelly and dirty really is that's the sort of shame, the cultural baggage that underpins it. So if you go into boots, you'll find a whole, shelf of stuff they call like feminine hygiene or whatever they call mm -hmm. it um which is you know for washing and spraying and trying to change the smell of your <laughs> your revolting female <laughs> that's me yeah. um and so you know i think it's i've tried to get that message in there that that you don't need to use any of those products and that vaginas and vulvas are meant to smell like vaginas and vulvas so hopefully um, in terms of like thrush and cystitis, that will help a bit because I think that's probably where it maybe where it could start. Mm. But um, you know, maybe I wonder if that's slightly more for sort of like teens rather than preteens. I don't know, or maybe now I'm thinking maybe I should have put put more in. But you know, it's difficult to know where to draw the line when you're doing a book. Mm. But, yeah. It's it's a it's an enormous problem and it's 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 a hidden and really silly problem because it's so solvable and it causes so much unhappiness. So with Duke of Edinburgh, I talk to 14 year olds about it, but obviously I'm just a one woman band talking to about 100 girls a year, which isn't many. Yeah. And and, and yeah, you know, I one of my son's girlfriends was a doctor and she ended up in hospital with you know cystitis that went to her kidneys and it, it's an enormous hidden problem and it yeah. I don't know feel like a one-woman band trying to tackle it which I'm you know and I'm just an old dentist so it's a bit nuts <laughs> what wrong end what what do you advise them to do to prevent it I mean what's the key key message okay so what on Duke of Edinburgh girls tend to not want to drink so that they won't have to pee in public and find a bush because a lot of the girls that that, that do it are worried about that you know they, they haven't done they haven't done this sort of outdoory stuff so I sort of reassure them about that and I say it's very important to drink and it's always important to drink water and if you're going on gap years after school or what have you it's very important because of all the bacteria that do linger around there and they will do a takeover if you're not careful and when you pee it will feel like peeing razor blades it's very uncomfortable and you mustn't ignore that because it can cause a kidney infection and when you treat this you know and then I talk about the cystitis and thrush um, and just just say that you know these are how these things interact and you have to learn to manage it all and you'll be fine basically yeah. <laughs> but it's it's just you know I feel silly that talking about it makes me feel a bit strange that I'm suddenly bringing it into Duke of Edinburgh and yet it doesn't seem to come you know and they all say we had no idea you know and then later when I was talking to my own daughter and my son's girlfriends they've all experienced this and my daughter was really ill on her gap year in the Philippines you know, she was hospitalized so it, it is a huge issue for young women and girls and it seems to get lost in the mix somewhere and I know it's not really your thing either because you know you're doing what you're doing but well, I don't know I just there now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a think please okay. thank you I've taken up too much time thank you. Campaign yeah get yourself a social media account and just oh you know, I hate social media <laughs> <laughs> thank you Time for a um, Elizabeth's got a question. Uh, does Lily feel an optimism that women on the ground, not working in the birth world, are resistant to these imposed language changes? Alison, you broke... Any optimism? Do, you, do I feel any optimism? I heard you were breaking... I beg your pardon. Oh, 
Yeah. Do you feel any, any optimism that women on the ground, not working in the birth world, are resistant to these imposed changes of language? Is that any clearer? Yes, I've got you now. Yes. Oh my gosh, absolutely 100% do I, because what happened to me last year and you know or the year before has has uh, although at the time it felt catastrophic has actually sort of catapulted me into a whole new group of women and the women that i've i've made contact with because of what happened to me it i mean it's just an army of of um of people who are fighting this these ideological changes um the the people in the birth world are in a way in a minority it seems to me now in the sense that they are you know there is still quite a lot of ideological capture in the world of birth breastfeeding and menstruation but it's amazing how many of those people will message me privately and say i can't talk about this on social media or in my workplace or wherever it may be but i completely support you thank you so much for what you're doing so i think that it is, it's like a silent majority. Um, and, you know, I've never had so much support in my life as I've had in the past year or so. Um, so I, I feel very optimistic about it. I think it's amazing that, you know, the kind of activism that's happening amongst women, especially in the UK at the moment is absolutely inspirational, you know, and it's, it's constant. Every single day, um, I find, you know, new stories on, on, you know, especially on Twitter, where I basically live. <laughs> I find new stories of, um, you know, that, that inspire me of, of the things that women are doing, court cases they're bringing, activism, you know, organisations they're running. You know, it's, it's incredible. So, yeah, I, can, I do feel optimistic, actually. Can people still hear me or have I frozen? Great. Um, Anna's asking a question. No, you're fine. We can hear you. Yeah, I, think. I, I can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm asking a question. Is there any evidence, is there any evidence that gender ideology has had any impact on the word man in healthcare? Did you get that? Yes, I did get that. I think it's hardly noticeable. Um, there's one or two uh minor incidents have occurred but mainly it's it's definitely all happening around female words and women did you get that are you there okay something a bit weird going on with my connection i think i don't know if it's me um, i think so is it me um kate's going to ask a question Kate's going to ask a question now. Kate. Okay. I'm sorry if I keep freezing. Welcome, Kate. You're not, it's, you're fine, Millie. It's okay. okay. Not me then. Okay. Uh, hi, Kate. Kate. Hi, hi, Millie. Hi. Yeah, I'm um, so it's me, me again. Yeah. Um, um, I'm I'm a midwife and a health visitor, um, and I find it really frustrating. I, I put it in my in the in the comments, um, the language that's used um, in theory as well. So the guide the guidelines that kind of dictate a lot of the clinical decisions that are made. Um, and if you actually look at a lot of the the nice guidelines, you know, and and how they they um they value different types of research you actually find that sort of qualitative or you know women's narrative and women's experience is very much of kind of just seen as a bit of a poo-poo version of, of of research and 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 study really um you know and 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 i find it so frustrating that so much of the guidance is um uses you know really dehumanizing language like incompetent cervix failure to progress um you know and, and i just i just wonder sort of in regard to the actual you know i know that you, you've talked about the, the language and the terminology how how do you feel you know and, and i know it comes down to activism and, and keep you know we need to keep talking and, and shouting about this but but how do you feel that that we can make a change in regard to that when when so much so many of the policy makers policy makers behind a lot of the practice are men or you know very much drumming to the band of this patriarchal structure essentially 
Yeah, I mean, you raise really good points. Um, I think, you know, the, the point about um, the sort of dehumanizing language prior to all this <laughs> current dehumanizing language that we're talking about is a really good one. When I wrote Give Birth Like a Feminist, which only came out in uh, 2019, uh, 2018, I can't remember, you know, but only three or four years ago, um, you know, that was the language I was focused on. I've written whole sections about the language you're talking about, you know, the incompetent cervix and the failure to progress. And, you know, um, in fact, I heard it in, um, I'm sorry to keep going back to this is going to hurt. I'm slightly obsessed with this issue at the moment, but, you know, they're talking about how, I just watched the first episode today, actually, and they're talking about how, oh, I consented her. Um, and where they're using the, you know, instead of saying, um, you know, I offered her this choice and that choice and she gave her consent, I consented her. So it was me that did, it, did the consenting. There's something really weird linguistically going on there. Do you know what I mean? But it's take, it's completely removing the woman from the sentence in a way from as from being the active, what is it? I mean, I wish I'd paid more attention in English language at school, but it's to do with the active person and the passive person in the sentence, isn't it? The, the person doing the verb is the is the doctor or midwife. I consented her rather than the other way around. Anyway, things like that drive me absolutely bonkers. And you're absolutely right as well about evidence, you know, um, and, and in terms of like women's, you know, experience, women's anecdotal experience, never carrying as much weight or being listened to. Um, you know, and that's why it is, maybe that's why I'm thinking about this is going to hurt because it's been absolutely, lo not lovely, but reassuring and, and powerful to see so many women on social media in the past few days talking about that television program and sharing their experiences um, of childbirth and how, you know, they felt, you know, belittled or patronized or like they didn't give proper consent or, you know, they felt they were victims of obstetric violence, all of these things. You know, in a way, as much as that's, as that's awful, I see that as a positive thing because, you know, those stories are powerful and you do hope that eventually people are going to start listening to those stories because you know I, I started the positive birth movement in 2012 and that's nearly 10 it's 10 years ago this autumn and I've been I've been listening to women's traumatic birth stories for 10 years now and it really makes me mad that it's still happening you know and this dehumanizing care still it seems to be and now because of the pandemic it seems to have got even worse um, so yeah, it's hard to remain optimistic, but you do hope that eventually, you know, women are start, going to start being listened to. But the other thing that, that your point raises is this thing about safety versus experience. And that's, until all of this, um, you know, gender uh, conversation happened, that was the thing that was, I was noticing constantly for years and years and years was, you know, we, you know, the, the, it was like an ideological battle between people who um, want women to have this amazing birth experience and then people on the other side who are interested in everyone being safe, you know, in safety as a priority. So that's where you get um, them saying things like, oh, the evidence says that you have to be induced by this date or the evidence says that um, there's, you know, there's no difference in pain levels between induction and um, spontaneous labor. And then on the other side, you get women saying, well, no, you know, that's not true. That's not what it was like for me. And so you have this kind of like battle where women are saying, you know, it matters to me how I give birth. What okay, slight like. problem there. You can you hear me? me? You seem to... Am I breaking up? Yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, have another bath. No, you were, you were you fine. Are a have another bath. Yeah. Your I'll, I'll just try and finish my point. Alison's feed seems to be very disruptive. Is it Alison, not me? Because I do. I, it yeah, no, it's, Alison, it's Alison's link, not you. Okay, because it could be that, I don't know, something's going on in my house I don't know about with people on screens maybe <laughs> no it's it's not you <laughs> okay yeah so I was just trying to just to finish my point I was trying to say you know that um there you know there's this battle I think between between safety and experience and you know again that comes back to this point about humanizing birth and you know how we really need to have both women want both of course everybody you know it's like the thing I've written about quite a lot is this a healthy baby is all that matters saying that you know women get told um, and, you know, of course, women for women, 
um, and their partners, everybody getting out of it alive is really important. <laughs> you know, there's nobody's going to deny that. But I think what I've always been saying is that that should be the baseline of expectations, not the pinnacle. So, you know, we've got a lot of stuff in, in place about birth safety now, and we need to also listen to women so that that anecdotal evidence that you're talking about, you know, and say, you know, it's not for them, it's not just about everyone having a pulse at the end of it, you know, there is more, and there's more to health and safety than just being alive as well, because women who have positive, empowering birth experiences come to the other side feeling positive, feeling well in themselves, physically um, less damaged, emotionally less damaged, sometimes even emotionally and physically they feel powerful, you know, it's like a for some women, it's like a sort of leveling up where they think, um, you know, giving birth has actually made me feel more powerful and stronger as a woman. And they can take that energy forward into their mothering, into their relationship, into their sex life, into their career, into their future plans. You know, it, it for women to come through childbirth feeling strong is a, is a positive for everybody involved. So, you know, it's, we, we've got to start focusing on on how birth makes women feel and making that a priority as well as just everyone being alive which is also really good <laughs> everybody wants that too yeah um ali, ali morris said, has told us about an event that's coming up in uh, in, in march uh, when i've just reposted it in the in the chat um and jenny jenny smith has got a question uh, she's had one bite. She's a bit shy to have the go, but go far away, Jenny. Your question. Oh, oh you George, George. Have to remind me. <laughs> um, it's not about surrogacy again, is it? <laughs> no, no, it's it's not. It's something different. I wanted to go back to the point that Alison raised about gender neutral language um, in the introduction to this when we, when we were talking about the. Uh, maternity minister, ministerial maternity bill and how important it was not to drop the words ma maternity mother you know so on um, but of course women have campaigned for a very long time to remove sex language when it's not needed and I just wanted to um uh, you know, so we say chair of governors, we don't say chairman of governors anymore, and so on. Um, and that's that has been important for women too. So I just I just wondered whether you had any thoughts about the I don't view it as a conflict, but I just I just wondered how you navigate those particular waters about when gender neutral is a good thing and when it isn't. Yeah, well, is it about who benefits um you know so wasn't there a Good really point. great um that really great interview with posey parker on um what was the who was the the man she was talking to where he was talking about you know having places like golf clubs <laughs> they were it was a similar point being made wasn't it that in that it's case Matt, it's, yeah, that's that was a way of keeping women from the sort of the corridors of power by having those those um, male only spaces. Talk radio, thanks. Someone's just popped up instead. Of. Um, so I think the reason that women wanted to have um, uh, to have to be like chair chairperson rather than chairman was because that was to women's benefit, because if you're saying chairman, you're, you know, you're excluding women from the possibility of taking on those leadership roles. Um, Absolutely, I mean, like I say, I, that's, that, but that's exactly the point I'm making is, is how do you reconcile that circle of, of why women need unsexed languages sometimes and sex languages sometimes? I know why we need both. Yeah. I'm just wondering how in the in this particular framework you you know you navigate that well just because I think we need we need sex-based language to challenge sex-based oppression would be my sort of soundbite on it so you know giving birth you know the, the stuff that I talk about is uh, is a sex-based experience 
Um, and, you know, in fact, I really recommend having a look at that paper that I talked a bit about in my talk because they've laid it out really clearly um, and broken it down into different um, sort of areas of, of, you know, why we need sex-based language. And I think that's a really good thing to have to refer to. Um, it's very, very good. Yeah, you've already seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's great. So it's, I think that's really helpful. Um, but yes, I think, you know, we, we need, uh, and I also think it's not just about challenging oppression, it's about celebrating, um, you know, women's bodies and women's biology. And I think that's an, another thing that, that um, sort of genderified or sex neutral or whatever you want to call it, de-sex language takes away. It takes away the, the ability to talk about, um, you know, women's unique experiences in a celebratory way, um, to be proud of our female body and our female biology. Um, and yeah, that, that's exactly it. what I think, you, you know, there's a difference between changing language to remove differences that don't exist or shouldn't exist. Okay. And using language that celebrates the differences that do and should. Yeah. And matter. You, you know, like any, anybody can be a police officer or a fireman. Not everybody can have a baby. Yeah. I think, you know. Yeah. I know I think that's a really good way of putting it and um, you know it's it's not it's not necessarily fashionable in feminism and it, it is quite difficult to navigate the whole idea of you know for example motherhood you know we've touched on it earlier when we we're talking about fertility but this you know the idea of celebrating motherhood is pretty loaded for many reasons <laughs> you know and it's not necessarily um, like I say it's not necessarily fashionable in in feminism to to write about motherhood or to talk about motherhood, especially in positive terms. You know, if, you I, if I went on Twitter and I said, being a mum is the best thing that I've ever done with my life. I mean, that would really cause a storm, wouldn't it? Do you <laughs> think that the current discussions around this are making some women rethink that and, and look again at the celebration of motherhood, which perhaps hasn't had much of a profile in hardline feminism. Do, do, do you think this might be a positive thing? I think that's a really good point because I think that, you know, when something's under threat, you tend to kind of assess it again in a new way, don't you? So it is making women say, hang on a minute, is there something special about being a woman as opposed to a person? Is there something special about being a mother as opposed to a parent? What is that? What does it mean to me? What do those words mean to me? How do they resonate? You know, so yeah, I think that's a really good point that it's it's perhaps making women feel like actually this is territory that I want to defend because it's meaningful to me in a way that perhaps if it wasn't under threat, they wouldn't be necessarily having to evaluate it in that sense. So yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's interesting actually, yes. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for that, that point that's made me think. I think I may have lost. Mm. We've lost Alison, have we? Have we lost Alison? Hello, Alison, are you out there? I think we've lost Alison. Okay. Yeah. Let's see if there's another question. Oh, somebody asked to, um, if this one could be read out. Shall I read it out? Sure. Um, da, 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 da. um thinking of the comment earlier oh this is by melissa b by the way thinking of the comment earlier on girls holding back on their duke of edinburgh trips what do you think about the impact particularly on girls but also boys in terms of privacy and health well-being regarding mixed sex toilets in schools especially in terms of the stress of having periods particularly when heavy and painful and everything that comes with that and i've heard awful things about school students, both female and male, refusing to use the bathrooms all day. Also, I delivered a workshop in a secondary school recently in which there were no single sex toilets. It was an open space of sinks with boys cubicles on one side and girls on the other. Someone had put bins in front of the girls cubicles to keep them open, clearly a prank. I was only there a day and could see female spaces being affected. So, yeah. Well, probably preaching to the converted in this group but obviously I think that that you know I don't think I necessarily have come into this conversation because of you know 
the toilets issue I think it's more I think there's it's so much wider ranging than that and you know there you know for example sports for example is such a you know it's 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 a more it's a kind of more obvious topic sometimes when it comes back to um bathrooms and toilets and stuff I kind of think oh because then it's just so easy for the for it to slide into a kind of tit for tat on you know all there's nothing you know it's someone who's like you know that men aren't a threat to women and yes they are and if you know if they're trans boys or trans you know it just gets really sort of like nitty nasty and I, I don't know I just think sometimes it's it's a a bit of a fraught topic but I mean at the same time when you tell stories like that you can just see how it's a no-brainer that in a in a school you know to have um sex sexed bathrooms <laughs> is um is really going to be helpful especially for girls it's going to be girls that suffer from mixed bathrooms especially at school level um so yeah that you, you know, it's it's madness hello you're back yeah, sorry about that. Maria had a point. I've lost all the questions so far, but Maria did have a question about um, the Adam K as an anti-hero. Maria, do you want to ask this or make the point? Hopefully you're still here. No audio, no. she says. Okay, right. Well, um, I think that the point that she was trying to make was um, that uh, having seen the, uh, the Adam K show it seemed to be as though Ben Whishaw was playing it as he was being the anti-hero not a goodie at all that he was deliberately doing it as a bad guy uh, do you have any comment about that or is that just are we comforting ourselves somehow <laughs> well I've heard that said um and I'm, I'll confess I haven't watched um every episode of the series but I have you know been you know seen a lot of the book and I I do you know, and I've, I have heard that argument made, but I just think the fact that it's meant to be funny um, is, is worrying. Um, you know, the fact that, you know, it's also very interesting that I, there was another really good article that came out about it today, you know, just about how a lot of people have commented about how the women in it are all kind of like, you know, objectified and kind of, you know, degraded when he's the sort of linchpin in the middle, who's kind of like, um, you know, the focus of attention all the time even though it shouldn't really be about him so yeah I, I I don't I don't think it has got for me it hasn't really got any redeeming features <laughs> sorry I don't think I'll be watching that one somehow um now so uh, it's the fact that it's meant to be funny that I think it's really bothering people it's kind of like you know women's trauma isn't isn't a joke you know um, Nigel, Nigel Scott had a point that he was going to make. Uh, Nigel, I don't know if you're with us still, but you were talking about uh, having worked for the, the Herpes uh, Trust um, and the fact that people seem not to know a lot uh, about their own bodies. Over to you. Hello, I'm here. Can anyone hear me? Um, yeah. 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 Yes. Um, it, it's just a kind of part of life experience, I suppose, but but having worked for a, for a charity involved with sexual health for over 20 years and taking an awful lot of phone calls, mostly from women, it's just quite astonishing. Well, it's not astonishing anymore. It's just part of the job that you realize that so many women are told very little or understand very little about their own bodies. And I'm supposed to be helping and advising them. And of course I was working across the office from, from the charity director who was a woman and uh, she, so I pretty quickly got up to speed and I could always shout across the room to her, does this make sense? Does, does this sound right? Um, but I was just giving out all this advice on a regular basis that most women didn't seem to understand. You know, I'm not talking about herpes treatment advice. I'm talking about just basic stuff about comorbidities and treating thrush and all, all of that. Mm. Um, it's astonishing because, you know, thrush seems to be a regular thing and yet the, the amount of uh, ignorance and lack of understanding of how to treat it is, is, is all across the board. Anyway, that's just me having a rant. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's depressing to hear. Do you, do you, did you treat men as well in your, in your practice? Yeah, well, we, we're just giving most of it's emotional and, and treatment advice. 
and yes, men as well. But as you probably aren't surprised to learn, it's the uh, we'd get two thirds women, about a third men, perhaps. But it's mostly women who right. mo women are more likely to to want to do something if there's a problem, and men are more likely to ignore it and just hope it'll go away. Uh, so there's a there's an inbuilt bias amongst women, I think, to to be more interested in how to sort their bodily problems out rather than just hope they'll go away and that's that's, you, not, that's a good thing yeah did you, did you find the lack of awareness about their own sort of personal anatomy was more prevalent in women than in men in your experience um possibly yes it's good it's a good question uh yeah, possibly because it's you know the the thing is with men it's all it's all on the outside so it's it's yeah. there it is you know now so much of, of women's problems or women's issues are internal so they wouldn't know they wouldn't know about the cervix so they wouldn't know about symptoms whether the symptoms could be inside as well as outside all of that kind of stuff yeah yeah, yeah well something's going wrong isn't it in in mm. education um of of young people really um and obviously when we're, we're not going to help things by then introducing new words and new ways of describing things that are even more complicated and confusing yeah um, you know, as i yeah. said in my talk if people don't know where or what their cervix is it's not going to be very useful to be told oh or anyone who's a cervix owner needs to come and have this particular yeah. test and, and the, um, amount of, the amount of time sorry to cut across um yeah. The amount of time we have to correct misinformation given to women about childbirth, about about whether they could have birth, give naturally give birth if they have genital herpes, for instance, of course they can. It's very very rare that there's a problem. But nobody told. Not only does nobody tell them, but the midwives don't seem to know. Um, that that nobody seems to tell the midwives, and they have. To, and if if a woman goes to a midwife and says, "By the way, I've got genital herpes. What should I do about it with for childbirth?" They say, "Oh, I don't know. I'll have to check, or I'll let you know." Or, or well, of course they should know. Ten percent of women have genital herpes, so it's not. They should come across it quite often. Anyway, yeah. that's it. Is me whinging again? <laughs> no, it's yeah. it's a really good point, and I think you know a lot of it is some or some of of the problem is to do with shame and embarrassment around yeah. the female body yeah. as well and that's why these messages aren't getting across um, and aren't being properly taught and aren't being properly talked about in families um, you know because there's quite a lot of shame and stigma around women's bodies you know in in my period book I sort of talk about a little bit about the sort of funny words that we have we have funny words for periods you know we call it getting the painters in or flying the red flag or whatever or on the blob and all of these funny euphemisms that we have and then we also have you know especially for little girls you quite often hear that you know they they don't know the word they don't know well it was on the radio in fact a couple of weeks ago wasn't it they were discussing how women don't or people don't know the difference between a vagina and a vulva and there's a there's a yeah. Yeah. really awful television program which we don't even want to start discussing at this point of the evening but where there's like they do this kind of dating thing where they have to sort of look at each other's naked bodies anyway let's move on from that but in in that program they keep talking about this, the woman's vagina when they actually mean her vulva um and so many people you know don't have these conversations and a lot of a lot of people don't talk to their children about their body parts and name them correctly it's really really common because it's people actually can't say the word vulva. They find it really hard to say, or vagina, but vulva in particular is a word that a lot of women haven't even grown up saying. A lot of women hide their period completely from their children. Um, you know, and so all of these things, although we don't think of them necessarily as, you know, having any kind of impact, they all, have, you know, all put together, they do have an impact and they end up in, you know, situations that you're, discussing I guess you know Nigel yeah. of not 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 having much knowledge because how can you have knowledge if you if you haven't got the words maybe that's kind yeah. of like the summary of everything for this evening is like you know all language is related to power and knowledge and ownership and change and all of those things we need words for all that yeah I mean yeah. sex and that thing sex related things are an important part part of everybody's life so it's it's only natural that people should have the language and have the confidence to be able to discuss things like that. Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks. 
I think if we if if we're going into Orwellian terms, then if we are getting rid of the words that we could use for things, we won't have the concepts for which the words were made. Um, Evelyn, I think, has got a couple of points to make. Yeah, that's a that's a brilliant point. Just to say, Alison, that there, there was a really good um, there's there's a uh, some women who are writing about what's going on within La Leche League at the moment. And for those who haven't heard of La Leche League, it's like a big international breastfeeding support organisation. And and there was a pretty good blog post by one of them recently where they were talking about, you know, and it just they just articulated it really well. But they were talking about how not using words, you know, by not having words in the language, it's like that's that, that an erosion happens. They didn't use the, the metaphor of like um, sort of waves on a rock, but that's what it made me think of how it's just like such a small it seems like such a small change, but how very quickly that will have a sort of longer term impact in terms of words just not being there anymore. I'll have to find okay. something and post it for you. Yeah, Evelyn, are you going to uh, make your comment, please? Are you here? Sorry. Uh, yes, I am here now. Um, I was just uh, commenting that um, I don't believe that um, we've changed our language around mothers um, in, 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 with respect to maternity and birthing um, because of trans men. Because um, the number of people who become trans men, number of women who become trans men, the number of those who actually become pregnant and have children must be really, really small. And um, plus the fact that actually trans men are not particularly respected uh, within uh, the trans community. They, they don't have much of a say. I, I do not believe that, this, that the change of language is about trans men. I believe that it's about trans women um, because trans women cannot become pregnant and have babies. That was my comment, which is something actually that Millie, that you said, you said earlier anyway. Um, so. Yeah, I think I, I sort of mentioned that in my talk. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, you know, if you uncouple the concept of woman from, from female biology, then you make woman a more open category. Yeah. Which is what you're saying, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And and birthing is is the point at which they really can't, they just cannot pretend. They could, they're not involved, they're not there, it's not for them. Yeah. Although there are attempts at, you know, pretending to menstruate and pretending to breastfeed. Uh, but birth is a little bit and I've seen, yeah, I mean there is sometimes attempts at um yeah faking but the birth process but you know like you say you can't really it's pretty hard to <laughs> fake and but i just also wanted to thank you very much for everything that you're doing for women I, um we really need heroines and you're one of them and thank you very much oh evelyn that's really kind of you to say that thank you that's lovely it's true thank you touch by that. erica adler has a, a point uh, which I think is really valid. I, I, I'd like to, your comment on uh, on her point. Erica, over to you. I think Erica's with us now. Erica, you're muted, so perhaps you'd like to unmute yourself. Sorry, sorry, I'm unmuted now. That's okay. I just, want, I just wanted to say um, how much I enjoyed um, your talk, Millie, and how much I'm enjoying this discussion. Um, it's, it's one of the things that hasn't been mentioned really um, uh, about um, how we bring up boys um, because if that isn't addressed then how are we going to change anything really there was a really good program on tv a few years ago called no more boys and girls in which a researcher went into a primary school and um, tried to uh, successfully degendered all the activities all the lessons all the um, sports and um, spare time activities and over the course of the year there was tremendous differences in how the boys saw the girls and how the girls saw the, saw them, the boys and how they saw each other um, and it, it, it was really really interesting and I think with, with you know the um, there was some talk about the toilets and um, shared toilets 
And why are we expecting boys to just normally be mocking and insensitive to girls when they're having their periods? Why is that the fact? Why, why aren't boys taught at school and at home to have um, respect for women's bodies and to, to think that's just a normal everyday thing. It's nothing to laugh at. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, that's one of the things I think we should be focusing on. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, I, I really agree with you. And, um, you know, I think that the, the shame and stigma, you know, we, as, as parents, you know, we can pass that on to our, our sons as well as to our daughters, can't we? Yeah. Um, you know, the things like, you know, not letting your children see that you're menstruating, you mm -hmm. know, it's really helpful for boys to have that completely normalized and yeah. you know, to see period blood and to know what's going on and for it not to be thought of or talked about as something secretive or shameful or disgusting. Um, all of those things I think we, we can do on an individual level as parents, but how you address it at a sort of a population level, it's really difficult, isn't it? And I think, you know, there is that awkwardness of being teenage and, you know, that you, you can't necessarily, it's, it is difficult to get around. Yeah, you know? yeah it is. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I think a lot of boys would probably be, be quite respectful, but it's the culture, the sort of laddish culture that kind of tends tend to sweep over uh, boys particularly and I suppose that there's a similar culture that sort of uh, affects girls but it's not conducive to um, mutual acceptance and, and kindness to each other and that's something yeah. that could be uh, in, addressed through education I think and maybe public com campaigns about it. Yeah and but again to do that you have to acknowledge sex differences don't you? Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is another thing that you know and it was, it was interesting what you're saying about the school where everything was kind of made gender neutral because in a way it's that's you, you want that it's, it's, mm -hmm. in some ways you want that don't you because you want you know equal opportunities and for mm -hmm. everyone to be treated equally but also you do want to be able to oh have the language to highlight sex differences. Yeah. So, that just reminded me of something that happened in that programme because one of the things the researcher suggested or, or introduced to that, to that class of children was that they all shared the same toilets. And that was the one thing that the children didn't want, the girls and the boys. They didn't want to share toilets. They rebelled against it. It was the one thing that was unsuccessful. Right. All the other things he suggested were really, really uh, positive. But they were very insistent on that. So, you know, that that's also interesting. It'd be interesting to find out what that was about. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, that is yeah. interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's this it's different for, for teenage for, for sort of teenagers and sort of you know, school children. I think they're it's different, you know, that they do definitely go through a phase where mm -hmm you know, they are embarrassed by some of the changes in their bodies during puberty mm. and that, that is mm. also normal. We shouldn't be sort yeah. of like making them feel like, oh, you have to walk around showing everyone your period blood, you know, <laughs> because no, you know, right. no one's going to feel comfortable doing that, you know, and, and that's that's not the same as sort of destigmatizing it. It's, you know, it, it, that's why we do need sex segregated bathrooms as well, maybe because Absolutely. of that awkwardness. Um, and then, yeah. then what you want is for those teenage, teenagers to grow up into the kind of sort of reconstructed adults who can cope um, with those discussions and who can, mm. you know, use the right words for, the, you know, for mm. their bodies and, you know, not be, have too much shame about their bodies either. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid we may have gone over time, um, uh, Millie. Do you think you could answer one more question? Yeah, uh, sure. If Amy Poole, I think, has a question. Amy, you had a point you wanted to, to make. Are you with us, Amy Poole? <laughs> yes, it, it wasn't so much as a question. It was just something I've noticed recently on all sorts of areas. The talk about, you know, trans women being able to give birth and men can give birth too with those. I think there's two very rare cases of people with mosaicism. Um, and it's, as Evelyn's pointed out, it's kind of, it's almost, it's the fantasy, but I'm feeling like the, it's trying to make the fantasy reality and people are believing it almost without any substance, but the changes in language is seeming to be, to try to pave the way for that. I wondered if you had any thoughts about, about that angle. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, it is this, you know, the birth world, obviously, because I follow quite a lot of birth you know social media accounts um some of whom don't you know don't speak to me anymore but you know people send me these things where you know there there are posts and it's it's someone with a beard and you know like a, a maybe a, a 
a graphic design sort of cartoon type drawing or whatever but it's it's a, someone who clearly looks like a man but who has a, a pregnancy bump and then underneath it says men give birth to so it's that's a really interesting phenomena isn't it um and uh, you you may be right about it it paving the way for for other things um there was a really interesting um youtube um discussion that i watched recently with somebody called dr suzanne is anyone going to leap up and say what her surname was is it veerling um, and she was on that the YouTube channel called Whose Body Is It? Um, some of which I find a little bit like oh, it's quite out there, but also it was, it was just such an interesting discussion because she was talking about the racist origins of, you know, the dehumanizing language and how when, the thing that really switched her on to it all was, this, you know, seeing things like the expression black birthing bodies and how resonant that was of, you know, what happened under, you know, in the United States, sort of under slavery and it was such an interesting um discussion and she was talking about that as well that you know they a lot of it was we don't know what is being paved the way for at the moment you know we when in those times you know when they were doing one thing on monday they didn't necessarily see coming what was going to come on tuesday in terms of how the de dehumanization of women allows them to be commodified. That was mainly my, my takeaway point of what she was talking about um, and how once you, de you know, once you break people up into body parts and dehumanize them, you, they then become um, collateral and, and, and commodified in a way that you, you that the opportunities uh, uh, for people who wish to make money are limitless. <laughs> So, you know, it was, it was quite interesting to think about it like that. And yeah, I don't know, um, I don't know what you think about it, but I'm not sure where we're headed with it all. You know, there has also been news stories about the possibility of men's actual biological male people potentially being, you know, being able to give birth. There's also news stories about, uh, you know, pregnancy happening outside the human body. Um, it's hard to predict isn't it and will there be a kind of reclaiming of of nature on women's behalf and on the on humans behalf will people stand up and say no we don't want that to happen or will it you know will will it move that way whether we whether we like it or not and i'm talking about into the future here not next week kind of thing <laughs> Would it be nice if they could cure, cure AIDS and uh, cancer first, hey? Uh, <laughs> it's been a really fascinating discussion. Yeah. I've had a really great evening. Thank you so much for all you've said to us tonight, uh, Millie. Um, and thank, thanks everybody for all the questions. It's been really interesting discussions. Um, and it's been a really great evening. So much so that I forgot we were, we were supposed to be finishing earlier. So uh, uh, sorry for that. Um, our next talk is going to be on the 14th of March. Sorry. Billy, you were going to say. Well, I just wanted to say thank you, but thank you very much for having me. I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's, it's been really great. Um, our next talk is on the 14th of March, Monday. I'll be talking to Marianne Seacart then about her book, The Authority Gap. Um, and it also, it says, and what we can do about it. So that's in the last chapter. <laughs> um, do look out for the announcement or sign up to our website, liberalvoiceofwomen.org, and we will send you the invitation as soon as it comes out. We also want to hear from you any policy-related issues or problems that you want us to raise. Thanks to Anna, our technical staff and organiser of our Eventbrite Zoom meetings. Thanks to all of you for being part of this great event. And most of all, thanks to our speaker, Millie Hill, for talking to us about all of these issues and making us focus, really, once again, on what's absolutely the basics about birth and pregnancy and maternity. Thanks again. Thank you very Good much. Everybody. Thanks so much for Cheers. having me. Anytime. Cheers. Cheers. Good night, everybody. Good night.